he gave us the most spectacular bridges, the longest tunnels, incredible ships, and the greatest railways. I'm on a journey around Britain to tell the story of perhaps our greatest engineer of all time, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He was a charismatic character who pushed the boundaries of engineering to the absolute limit. He helped to shift perceptions about what engineers did and the way their work could change the world. In the middle of the 19th century, Brunel was at the forefront of an industrial explosion that changed the world. His achievements were breathtaking, but occasionally he failed. There were enough problems with the atmospheric railway to make it hopelessly unviable from the very start. Brunel was fiercely demanding of all those around him and would stop at nothing to realize his dreams. But with access to his personal archive, I discover another side to the engineering genius. This is Isambard Kingdom Brunel's private diary. He's worried, he's worried about what's gonna to happen to him in the future. I'm now retracing his steps to discover the man and the engineer. Wow. This is the fascinating story of the man who built Britain. By 1838, Brunel, now 32 years old, had already made a name for himself with the Thames Tunnel, the mighty Great Western Railway, and his transatlantic steamship, the SS Great Western. By now, Brunel was at the height of his power, already well on the way to securing his place as one of the great engineers of the Victorian age. But restless and relentless by nature, he wasn't one to rest on his laurels. Even greater challenges lay ahead. In 1838, the maiden voyage of Brunel's first ship, the SS Great Western, had emphatically demonstrated the power of steam over sail. But that wasn't enough for the man behind it all. He was now ready to capitalize on its trailblazing success. Brunel was about to take everything he'd learned in building the Great Western to create something even bigger and even bolder. The resulting ship would be a game changer that would transform and revolutionize shipbuilding forever. That ship was the SS Great Britain. Today, this awesome craft has pride of place in the Bristol Dry Dock where she was built. At the time, she was the largest ship afloat at 322 feet long and 51 feet wide but her size wasn't her greatest claim to fame. Brunel was a visionary, brilliant at grasping new ideas and quick to incorporate them into his thinking, taking everything to a whole new level. Two of the very latest technological inventions still in their infancy were cleverly embraced and combined by Brunel. The first was a hull made completely of iron the material which enabled the Industrial Revolution gave Brunel greater freedom in designing his ship. Brunel wanted to build the biggest ship in the world, but he also wanted to build a luxurious steamship for passengers. So in order for them to travel in the best possible comfort, you need a lot of big space inside the ship. So uh, building a ship like that in timber would mean a lot of cross members, cross structures that would take away space inside. And with iron hulls being possible to be built in much thinner material, you gain space inside compared to timber. Was there any reason why a ship like the Great Britain hadn't been built before? I think you needed somebody who had a lot of courage to take it on, and Brunel was the man to do that. He bravely exploited this new material's properties. Iron was stronger, lighter and cheaper than wood and could be used to make strengthening partitions down the length of the ship called bulkheads, a groundbreaking innovation that's become standard in today's ship design. But the second of the ship's big technological innovations can be found at the stern. Nell was one of the first to realize that propeller technology was the future. 
By now, his standing as a respected engineer was so great, the Navy offered him use of their ships to run his trials on. His research resulted in this whopping six-bladed propeller. And it was so successful that even modern propellers are only about 5% more efficient. The Royal Navy itself took great interest in Brunel's experiments with screw propellers. Paddles on the outside of their ships left them vulnerable and exposed to enemy fire. Propellers, on the other hand, were hidden underwater with the potential to be lighter, cheaper to produce, and far more efficient. Just like the iron hull, Brunel hadn't invented the screw propeller, but he had a canny ability to see where technology was headed before anyone else. Brunel wasn't exactly an inventor. Concepts like railways or um, steamships or iron ships are just too broad to have individual creators and inventors. Brunel's genius lay in taking existing ideas, often other people's ideas, and radically improving them and putting them together in new ways. In 1843, the Great Britain was ready for launch. But for an unconventional ship, life on the high seas was never going to be plain sailing. What happened when they came to launch the Great Britain? The launch itself went really smoothly. The problem was that she was so big she couldn't fit out through the lock gates in Bristol Harbour, so she remained in Bristol for nearly a year. So what did they have to do? Rebuild the whole harbour? The story goes that Brunel went down to the lock gates in the middle of the night and tore them down with his men because there was a spring tide, it was the ideal opportunity to get the ship out, and he wanted to get it done. In 1845, the Great Britain embarked on her maiden transatlantic voyage from Liverpool to New York, where she was greeted by rapturous crowds. For the next 100 years, the Great Britain had a long and colourful working life. She functioned as an emigrant ship to Australia, served as a troop carrier in the Crimean War, and as a supply ship during the First World War. Her career came to an end in one of the furthest outposts of the Empire, where she was scuttled and left to the elements in the Falkland Islands. But in 1970, she was rescued and brought back home to Bristol. Brunel's genius created what is arguably the single most important vessel ever built. Its combination of iron hull, screw propeller and steam propulsion essentially formed the modern ship the SS Great Britain changed shipbuilding forever. Just next door to this maritime masterpiece is the Brunel Institute, an extraordinary gold mine of the man's most personal papers and belongings. I've got special access to these priceless objects, which cast light on his genius, his precision, and ferocious attention to detail. This is... Uh... A mahogany box containing Isambard Kingdom Brunel's drawing instruments. So I.K. Brunel on a plaque on the top. <laughs> so these are the instruments that he would have used to design his engineering projects. Yeah. So we think it was 1836 to 1858 he was using these. So okay. really, you know, the centre of his working life. They've all got uh, initials on here. It's all got I.K.B. But the interesting thing is, if you look at them, some of them have got slightly different ones from others. So what we think this shows is that, you know, it's a working set. Throughout its life, some of the things have become lost or maybe damaged, and then he's replaced them with others. Wow, yeah. This looks pretty well used, this drawing pen. Can we have a look at that? Yeah, of course. I really like this one because if you look at the handle, yeah. on this side, it's, it's white, it's, it's fairly clean. Yeah. Turn it over, oh, it's yeah. discoloured. Yeah. This isn't dirt that you could just sort of wipe off. This is stuff that's really got into the ivory. It's, yeah. it's from use and use, and over and over again, it's really become ingrained in there. That is lovely. I'd like to hold it? Oh, yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, to think what oh, this drawing pen here might have actually sketched out, and now I've got it in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's such an amazing, beautiful thing to look at now, but these are working instruments. They're lovely, Nick. Absolutely lovely. These marvellous tools of Brunel's trade had so far sketched out some of the finest, most admired pieces of engineering ever built. But at the height of his career, with the world at his feet, 
was Brunel about to be blinded by his own brilliance and make the biggest blunder of his career? With the successful completion of the SS Great Britain, Brunel's reputation and workload was at an all-time high. But it came at a cost. He was a complete workaholic who thought nothing of toiling 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And inevitably, it was a regime that would eventually take its toll. A lot of the time he wasn't at home. So what was his family life like? He his... worked terrifically long hours and often would fall asleep on the, the couch in his office, often with a lit cigar. So friends would come in in the morning to find a whole cigar's worth of ash on his shirt front. So I think the sheer unpredictability must have made him very hard to live with and probably utterly exhausting. <laughs> Fueled by his ambition and self-belief, in 1845, Brunel propelled himself into his next engineering endeavour. But it would be a project so daring and cutting edge, it threatened to tarnish his track record. Brunel was on a roll, and his next project was to expand his great Western Railway empire. Having conquered the Bristol to London line, he now set about building a brand new route out of Bristol deep into Devon and Cornwall. But building a railway in this part of the world brought a whole new set of challenges. Chief amongst them was the region's geography. But Brunel had heard of a new innovation that might overcome it the atmospheric railway. Brunel was made engineer of the South Devon Railway in 1844, and he was tasked with delivering a railway from Exeter to Plymouth. Now, he followed the coast from Exeter through here at Star Cross to Newt, and that was flat. It's fairly curvy, but it's straightforward in railway terms. The problem is that beyond Newton Abbott, the railway has to cross the foothills of Dartmoor, and that becomes viciously steep. There's no way round it. And so Brunel believed that the atmospheric railway would offer a solution to getting trains over these vicious hills faster and more efficiently than the steam locomotives of the day could manage. The concept for the atmospheric railway was relatively simple. A cast iron pipe with a slot on top was laid along the centre of the track. A piston fitted inside the pipe connected to the lead carriage. The pipe was made airtight using a flexible leather seal covering the slot. Steam pumps were placed in engine houses at intervals along the track. These pumps sucked the air out of the pipe in front of the piston, creating a vacuum. The piston and the attached carriages above were then pulled forward. So the idea was it would literally suck the train along the coast. If you like, this was the railway vacuum cleaner of the 19th century. The, the principle is no different from drinking a drink with a straw. What did Brunel's peers think of it? Railway engineers of the day, people like George and Robert Stevenson, his own chief mechanical engineer in Swindon, Daniel Gooch, all said that Brunel was essentially crazy to even think about this. They pointed out that trains couldn't switch tracks, they couldn't reverse, that they were restricted to a single track. So this really goes against every sane bit of operating principle you can possibly imagine. Brunel being Brunel, he ignored them and did his best to prove them wrong. For the first time in his career, Brunel had made a massive error of judgment. Nevertheless, in 1847, Brunel's atmospheric railway opened. The atmospheric railway, in theory at least, had great potential. And this is one of a very few remaining pieces of it that still exist. And it gives you quite a good sense of how it would have looked. Instead of miles and miles of sleepers and track laid out along the railway embankments, you've got this whacking great big black pipeline laid out through the middle of it. It was this pipeline that proved to be the project's fatal flaw. The success of the atmospheric line, then, was all down to how airtight they could keep that tube. Ab absolutely, and the best they could come up with at the time was a leather flap along the whole length. But to keep it an airtight seal over that many miles is extraordinarily difficult. Then you have the problem of corrosion from the salt air and salt water. You have the fact that in the summer, 
the flap dries out, in the winter it freezes, both of which make this inoperable. And then you have the urban legend of rats gnawing away at the leather. Now, even if that happened, there were enough problems with the atmospheric railway to make it hopelessly unviable from the very start. After a year of setbacks, Brunel reluctantly accepted defeat. He agreed that the system wouldn't be extended. The pipeline was ripped up and conventional tracks were laid. It was a financial disaster. But even in failure, Brunel managed to leave a few of his indelible marks. Hey, here we are then. Even for something so functional as a pump house, mm. architecturally speaking, it's really quite stunning, isn't it? It is. I mean, he got criticised a lot for frittering away his time on these architectural details. But thank goodness he did, because the atmospheric railway may have been a failed experiment, but at least we can look back and say it bequeathed us some gorgeous buildings. Was Brunel simply ahead of his time, then, with this project? In terms of the concept of trying to seek a power source away from the tracks itself, you can argue that Brunel was seeking the nearest equivalent he had to electrification. But in reaching out for an alternative to the steam locomotive when there was none, Brunel has to be judged a failure on the atmospheric railway. After a staggering run of success, Brunel had come up short this time. It was a major setback, and the reputational damage was huge. For a man who valued that above everything else, it must have hurt. The failure of the atmospheric railway had come after two decades of non-stop work, all of which had left Brunel exhausted. In a letter to a friend, Brunel wrote, Here the whole world is railway mad. I'm really sick of hearing proposals. I wish it were at an end. To add to the professional unhappiness, there was private grief. In late 1849, his father, Mark, who had set him on the path to greatness, died aged 80. For the first time in Brunel's own frantic life, he took stock and began to contemplate the future. This is one of the uh, elevations for the house he planned to build in Whatcom in South Devon near Torquay. So this is some land and estate that he purchased in 1847 and he planned it as a grand family home. So it's beautifully designed, you have to say. And so around the time, in 1847, the atmospheric railway, it become a failure. Yeah. Do you think then maybe focusing his attention on something much more personal is an indication of maybe a change of attitude for him? Yeah, his, his letter books and diaries do give the implication maybe he's getting a little bit fed up and he's starting to think about one day retiring. What happened to his grand vision here then? He never got to see this house. It was never finished in his lifetime. They got as far as uh, laying the foundations. However, he did get to see the gardens that he planned. OK. So here we've got a Whatcom Garden sketchbook. I really like this because, being the engineer, he's drawn out all the different trees and shrubs that he's going to plant in his garden, and he's working out how quickly and how much they're going to grow in given years. So he's not just landscaping his garden, he is engineering his garden. He's engineering his garden, yeah, yeah. He never stops. <laughs> Brunel's period of self-reflection and retirement planning didn't last long. The lure of a new project was just too great for the obsessive genius. Brunel had smashed records for the transatlantic crossing, first with his SS Great Western and then with the Great Britain. Now he had his sights set on an even bigger prize, a prize that ensured the British Empire kept on expanding. By the 1850s, it was already a global empire, relying on steamships for communications, as well as the transport of people and goods. Coaling stations were set up in ports around the world for refueling the ships, but it was expensive. Coal could cost 10 times more than at home. But then, one shipping company asked Brunel a question. Could he build a ship capable of making the voyage from Britain to Australia with only one refueling stop? Typically, Brunel pushed the challenge even further. Could a ship sail all the way to Australia and then back again without needing to refuel at all? If the answer was yes and it could carry enough coal, just how big a ship would that need to be? For Brunel, this was an irresistible challenge. 
Like a man possessed, he started filling his sketchbooks with drawings and calculations. So this is Brunel's sketchbook from 1852 to 54, and on this page we've got one of the earliest drawings of the Great Eastern Steamship. Look at the size of it. It's so long, it takes up most of the width of the page. Yeah, I mean, it's a really fantastic drawing. And then he's actually drawn there, for a sense of scale, what looks like a, a naval ship, a HMS ship, to give you an idea of just how large it is. If these were some of the first drawings that Brunel ever did of the SS Great Eastern, then it shows he was thinking about having the paddle wheels and the screw propeller. Well, yeah, he knows that this is going to be the largest ship ever built, so he's obviously thinking, how are we going to get it sailing? He's using all the technology that they've got available at the time. Yeah. The thing I love about this page as well, you've also got figures and facts written around, so he, he's doing his calculations as he's going along. He's quite an artist as well, isn't he? Yeah. He drew the first picture in 1852, and one of his biographers has a really nice phrase. He says that after that time, gigantic ships haunt his sketchbooks. Really? So it's really, he's obviously got this idea, and now it's just, it's always there, bubbling away in the background. He's sort of working towards it. He's never going to let go of it until that, that dream is realised. Until he sees it happen, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. What a beautiful looking page that is. The SS Great Eastern was set to be a monster. A giant of a vessel, six times the size of the Great Britain. It was such a monumental undertaking, it became a celebrity in its own right. And soon, everyone was talking about the Leviathan. By February 1854, construction of the giant ship had begun. It was to be 700 feet long, powered by four giant steam engines that would drive a huge propeller with two vast paddle wheels on either side for extra power and improved steering. All this construction would take place on the bank of the River Thames, at this very spot. What would it have been like down here with this great big structure taking up the skyline? Uh, it dominated the whole area, and people came here to see it under construction. This was a visitor attraction. People who came to see it spoke of it resembling a fort more than a sailing vessel. Massive. So all the timbers that we can see in this, well, this vast area, this is the shipyard yard where she was built. This is where she was built and launched, and this is a fraction. Right. Uh, these, these ramps extend down into the river, and then there's a gap, and then there's another set of ramps like this, 100 paces up river. So two separate ramps carrying a cradle, and the cradle holds the ship. Building a ship side onto the river was highly unusual, but Brunel had little choice. A traditional slipway launch just wasn't possible, as the Thames was neither wide nor deep enough, at least not for a vessel that was like no other. What was unique about the Great Eastern? Well, this is the first modern ocean liner. Uh, what Isambard Brunel created here was a huge ship with 30,000 plates hammered into the vessel's hulls. Each plate had 100 rivets, that's 3 million rivets. And it's the first example of marine construction on an industrial scale. Brunel was about to pave the way for modern shipbuilding. But with the Leviathan taking three years to build and costs spiralling out of control, would this monster vessel be the one project that would break him? By the mid-1850s, Brunel's Great Eastern was set to become the largest movable object ever built by man. The great engineer had designed a vessel three times longer and six times heavier than his previous ship, the Great Britain. It could carry 4,000 passengers and 6,000 tonnes of cargo. To turn his dream into reality, Brunel was busting the budget, causing backers to go bankrupt and ploughing in his own money. But despite the stress and high stakes, he still came up with a string of engineering innovations. In Glasgow, one of the main centres of British shipbuilding, some of his techniques are in evidence to this day. It's the 
busy yard here, Chris, at the moment. Well, tell me exactly what is going on around us, what's being built here? It's always busy here at the moment. We're, we're the, probably the most exciting stage of this project, which is the first of the LNG dual fuel ferries that we're building uh, for runs on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, this one here, she's 75% of the way through the steelwork, due for launch in two months' time. So this is the busiest you'll see this project out on the berth. This is modern, high-tech shipbuilding. But how much of this actually draws on the innovations and the designs that Brunel brought together? A huge amount. We, uh, shipbuilding up until the mid-1800s was an art and a craft, and from the mid-1800s onwards, it became a science. What were the biggest challenges for him with, with a ship as big and as long as the Great Eastern. Up until that point, shipbuilding was very much a craft of wood, and the building blocks of ships were effectively big beams which were connected together one at a time, and they were responsible for holding the structure of the ship. Now, if you put loads and loads of those together, your ship becomes very bendy and very floppy. If they were a certain length, they would just snap in half. As we brought iron into the equation, we were able to build through bigger, stronger panels. Uh, I can show you an example in real life. You can't see much here, but down at the bottom, we've yeah. got an example. Let's yeah. have a look. Although this vessel and the Great Eastern are 160 years apart, their construction is strikingly similar. But whereas today's ship designers have welders, Brunel had 400 riveters, all working 12 hours a day, six days a week, to put everything together. This is brilliant, Chris. Yeah, along here, yeah. We can see it. So we're up much closer now, and this is looking along a cross-section of the hull. So what is it we're looking at, then? You could only do this with iron, you couldn't do this with wood. You see here, Every longitudinal element, and longitudinal is, is fore and aft in ship parlance, yep. uh, has got its own stiffening. So you'll see the longitudinal bulkheads have got their own stiffeners welded on. The shell plate has its own stiffeners welded on. And when you put them together in a box, they become a very, very stiff girder that doesn't then break when you go over waves the way that transversely framed ships would have. Now, the problem is if you have two shells which are very strong and a deck that's very strong and you put it in the water, it'll collapse on itself. So you put bulkheads in. This is a full width bulkhead to keep all of our strong elements apart from one another. This is great. So right in this section here, we can see strengthening lengthwise, longitudinal, with our stiffening vanes and you've got strengthening across the ship as well yes. with the bulkheads. Exactly. Another of Brunel's key innovations was the double hull. This strengthens the ship, can act as storage space, and is also a safety feature. If the outer skin is pierced, there's a better chance the ship won't sink. How visionary was Brunel then at that time? I'm incredible. I'm not sure he actually understood so many of the advantages that we still have now, and we continue to evolve his theories, but absolutely, he fundamentally stumbled onto something that, that has formed the backbone of shipbuilding ever since. With the Great Eastern rising up into the London skyline, Brunel appeared unstoppable. But behind the scenes, he was now increasingly dogged by illness. Although a labor of love, the sheer scale and complexity of the enterprise was pushing him to the limit. But the ambitious workaholic took on even more projects. Incredibly, whilst working on the SS Great Eastern, Brunel somehow found time to design and build one of his greatest ever structures. He needed a bridge to carry the new railway line linking Devon and Cornwall across the River Tamar. Not only did the bridge have to span this deep tidal estuary, 1,100 feet across, Brunel was also under strict orders from the Admiralty that it needed to be high enough to allow tall naval ships to pass safely beneath it at high tide. The result was this extraordinary structure here at Saltash, the Royal Albert Bridge. Conventional suspension bridges are anchored to the banks on either side by their supporting chains. With a span this wide and a bridge this high, that simply wasn't possible. For it to be strong enough to reach across the river and take the weight of a moving train, Brunel would need to ensure it was self-supporting. At the heart of Brunel's design is a two-span suspension bridge with a supporting tower or pier placed there in the middle of the estuary. 
And you can see Brunel's giant wrought iron tubular arches across the top of each of the central spans, with the suspension chains then slung beneath them. It really is beautiful. The construction of the bridge was hugely complex, and the biggest challenge of them all was erecting the central pier right in the middle of the River Tamar there. As ever, Brunel deployed an ingenious solution. In 1854, a great cylinder, 90 feet long and 37 feet wide, was floated into the middle of the river and lowered onto the bed. The water was pumped out and the top sealed. The confined space inside was pumped full of compressed air to prevent water seeping back in, while teams of men, 40 at a time, toiled, excavating the layers of mud that lay at the bottom of the estuary. It was backbreaking work, and conditions were grim. Laboring for days at a time in a pressurized cylinder, many men fell ill with compression sickness. These were the first recorded cases of the bends. Despite all the difficulties, once they hit solid rock, they could begin building up the foundations for the main central pier. In 1856, it cleared the high water level, which meant Brunel was ready for the next stage of his epic construction. The operation to maneuver the two giant trusses required military precision. But Brunel, the showman, turned it into a public spectacle. Each truss had to be floated into the middle of the river, where it took 500 men and five Navy vessels to wrestle them into position. Then, as the tide fell, the trusses sank onto the pier foundations. As the piers were slowly built up underneath, it took 10 months for each truss to be jacked up, three feet at a time, into their final resting place, a hundred feet above the water. The bridge finally opened in May 1859 with a lavish ceremony. Sadly, Brunel wasn't here. His declining health meant he'd been sent abroad on doctor's orders. When he did return, still unwell, Brunel was only able to take in his bridge through the window of a special carriage as it slowly made its way across. That was the last time he'd see what was to become one of his most enduring and iconic masterpieces. Brunel's continuing ill health was worsened by his relentless workload. While building the Royal Albert Bridge, he was still grappling with his biggest project of all. As the bridge slowly inched its way skyward above the River Tamar, the SS Great Eastern was getting ready to launch. It would enter the Thames here at Millwall. What is, what is it that we've got here then, Robert? What are we looking at? This is all that remains of the launchways that Isambard Brunel built to launch his great ship. These timbers then, are they, they're an extension of the, of the dockyard just there, are they? Yes, exactly and they went all the way from where we were down here because this ship was too big to be launched like all the others. It's 700 feet long. The Thames isn't wide enough. A ship of this mammoth size would have to be launched sideways into the water. This would be a slow and delicate procedure. So for the first time in his career, Brunel shunned the spotlight and requested that it be a low-key affair. On the day of the launch, Isambard Brunel said, don't come. It's not the launch you think it will be. There is no lady with a big hat and a big bottle of champagne. The ship will not gracefully slide down the launchways stern first into the water. There are two cradles. There are two sets of ramps. And we will push the cradles down the ramps by hydraulic rams until they reach the end, and we'll leave them there until the tide comes in and takes the ship and floats it off. It's not the launch you think it is. But the company was short of money, and they sold tickets. And 100, 
thousand people came here to see the biggest ship in the world not be launched. At 12.30 p.m. on the 3rd of November, 1857, Brunel ordered the release of the fastenings. The crowd gasped, first in awe, then in disbelief. The stern started to move too quickly, and the braking chains span on their drums, throwing two men into the air, killing one. The giant ship had only moved four feet. It just wouldn't budge any further. In fact, it took nine more weeks to get it into the water. The strain of the drawn-out launch had exacerbated Brunel's ill health, and by now his doctors had discovered the cause. Brunel had a serious disease of the kidneys. He was urged to go abroad to recover his strength. On his return, Brunel was determined to get the Great Eastern seaworthy for its first journey. But all the while, his health was slipping away. Despite being a very sick man, the day before the maiden voyage saw Brunel on deck, overseeing final preparations. But all was not well. He collapsed, having suffered a stroke. Brunel and the ship he referred to as his great babe were at their lowest ebb. Now aged 53, he was a shadow of his former dynamic self. But for the great engineer, things were about to take an even darker turn. On the 7th of September, 1859, the SS Great Eastern set out on its maiden voyage. But Brunel wasn't well enough to be on board. He lay desperately ill at home following a stroke, anxiously waiting for news. And when it came, it wasn't good. On the initial stretch of the voyage to America, the ship had been rocked by an explosion in the ship's engines. The forward funnel was completely blown off, killing six people. Sadly, this would be the last that Brunel would hear of his beloved ship. Five days later, the great man was dead, aged just 53. Brunel never got to see his final engineering masterpiece in action. This is quite a famous picture here, isn't it, Nick? It is, yes. Yeah. So this is the final picture ever taken of Brunel. It was taken on the deck of the Great Eastern. Within an hour or so after this photo was taken, he collapsed on deck with a stroke, and he was dead within 10 days. So this is the last view of Brunel. Do you think this actually says quite a bit about the state of the man, both mentally and physically? Because his clothes don't fit him that well, he's thin, he's, he's got his hat off, you can see how bald he is. Yes, the stress of the launch of the Great Eastern was really, I guess, too much. He'd had quite an eventful life, a lot going on, he was a workaholic. If you compare it to some of the earlier pictures and paintings of him, he doesn't really look like the same man. There's a vulnerability that you see within him there, which perhaps you don't see in many of the other images earlier in his life, mm. earlier in his career. Yeah, I, think, I mean, he's 53 in this image, and he, he doesn't look 53, he looks a lot older. He does look a lot older than that, yeah. yeah. As a passenger ship, the SS Great Eastern was a commercial failure. After the discovery of vast coal reserves in Australia, there was no longer a need for a ship that could sail there and back without refuelling. And when the Suez Canal opened in 1869, speeding up round the world sea travel, the Great Eastern was too big to go through it. How successful was the SS Great Eastern? Well, it never operated as an ocean liner, but it did lay the first three transatlantic communication cables. It was the only ship big enough to carry the cable. So although it wasn't taking passengers back and forth across the Atlantic, it was at least connecting them. Yes, it was. This role in laying the first permanent transatlantic telegraph cables in 1866 ushered in a new age of modern global communications. 
But more importantly, its pioneering design and construction laid the blueprint for the way all modern big ships are made. But it was built in the wrong era. Because it pushed the boundaries of what was possible in the Victorian age, it was too uneconomical to run. It ended its life as an advertising hoarding in Liverpool docks before being scrapped in 1889. The Great Eastern was a masterpiece touched with tragedy. So ahead of her time, she shaped modern shipbuilding. So out of time, her glory was short-lived and ultimately, she was destined for the scrap heap. Brunel's final project may have had mixed fortunes, but his reputation as one of the greatest engineers of the industrial age has grown stronger over the intervening years. Brunel's legacy, like that of any other really great man, is multifaceted. Most obviously, 1,400 miles of railway, which we still use to this day. Less obviously, he pioneered the idea that there could be powered travel, travel by steamship across the oceans. That's an idea which changed history. At a more metaphorical level, his career helped to shift perceptions about what engineering was and what engineers did and the way in which their work could change the world. How important is it that we acknowledge and celebrate Brunel today? I think it's really important because not only did he lay the, the physical foundations for a lot of our world today, but he was, I think, really inspiring because he did doubt himself sometimes. He's very human, but he never gave up and he was extraordinarily resilient. And, of course, he was something of an outsider as the child of immigrants to have made such a mark on this country, I think is something that absolutely should be applauded. I think we owe him a huge amount. Daniel Gooch, Brunel's close friend and fellow engineer, perhaps best summed up the great man when he wrote, by his death, the greatest of England's engineers has been lost. The man of the greatest originality of thought and power of execution. Bold in his plans, but right. The commercial world thought him extravagant, and although he was so, great things are not done by those who sit down and count the cost of every thought and act. And finally, the Clifton Suspension Bridge, Brunel's most defining work, and the one left unfinished since the early days of his career, would have the chance to rise again in all its glory. Two eminent engineers decided to revive the project as a memorial to Brunel. At last, the bridge Brunel described as my first child, my darling, was going to be finished, but not without some changes. John Hawkshaw and William Barlow were the chief engineers who took on the task. The towers were finally finished, though without Brunel's lavish Egyptian decorations. The road was widened and the whole structure strengthened to add stability. At the time, Hawkshaw was overseeing construction of the new Charing Cross railway station in London. But to build it, he had to demolish Brunel's hunger for bridge across the Thames. But in a neat twist, he realised he could reuse the chains from the Hungerford Bridge here on the new revitalised bridge at Clifton. And as an extra precaution, he added a third length of chain in addition to Brunel's original two. The bridge finally opened on the 8th of December 1864 to a great ceremony. 33 years after Brunel had won the competition back in 1831. Sadly, Brunel never got to see his iconic bridge in all its glory. But here it is. The project that brilliantly bookends his career. And for me, a fitting tribute to the great man and all his outstanding achievements. <laughs>